to mute.
Good afternoon. My name is Angela Dillard, and it's a rare pleasure to be here to congratulate We Listen on their fall conference and to introduce this afternoon's keynote panel. As the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education for Michigan's largest undergraduate serving college, the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, I've had the opportunity to think deeply about the new and developing trends on campuses like our own. I'm most struck by two things. The first is the sense of possibility to be in partnership with students, real and authentic partnerships, the ones that allow us to put ourselves in a position not only to teach young adults, but to learn from them and to learn with them. We Listen embodies this possibility. The second thing I've been most struck by is the potential of campuses, especially public institutions, 
to be the training ground for an education in democratic engagement, in civic responsibility, and in what some people call intercultural maturity, an ideal that embraces diversity of thought and diversity of identity, that accepts the fact that there are what we politely refer to as climate issues, especially around race, gender, national origin, while creating a durable apparatus for weathering the inevitable conflict. There is a big public narrative out there that college campuses are insular and protective to the point of coddling, intolerant of free speech and the free exchange of ideas, crippled by identity politics and inundated by smug liberalism. But the reality that I've witnessed on the ground is quite different as we've struggled here with an environment that year after year brings young people together from diverse identities and backgrounds, backgrounds that are often culturally, ethnically, and socioeconomically distant and distinct from one another because of the realities of res residential segregation in our country. Often educated in zero-tolerance high schools, they come without a strong set of skills to navigate this diverse and vibrant educational environment, and without a lot of models for how to do so well, certainly not in much of our media and our social media, or sadly in today's increasingly partisan and rancorous political arena. As a nation, we are increasingly divided by a common language. Enter, we listen. To quote Yvonne Yao, the Vice President of Marketing for We Listen, quote, it's important to bring together people with different political ideologies because we listen is changing the narrative that college students can't engage in conversation with those who have different opinions from them. Instead of debating or trying to convince others why your view is right, we instead are encouraging students to find common ground despite our differences and gain a deeper understanding of the values that shape others' opinions. This is an approach that can't be legislated or mandated in a top-down way. And it's not surprising that this impressive student organization has spawned a We Listen staff edition. Democratic engagement is like a muscle. It needs to be trained and exercised to grow in strength and flexibility. It takes a place like the University of Michigan, where we aspire to teach what can't be Googled, to demonstrate the proposition that information and knowledge are two very different things and to train students in the transferable soft skills, dare I say liberal arts skills, like intercultural communication, leadership, and empathy, among others, that will serve them well as they enter the workplaces and the communities in the future. We are doing this in units like the program in intergroup relations, and we listen for our students and our staff, and in the Ford School's ambitious Conversations Across Difference initiative, which launches this fall and of which today's politically ambidextrous panel is really indicative. I'm deeply inspired by the common mission that brings the Ford School and LSA together in sponsoring We Listen in today's conference, and that assembles all of us this afternoon for this keynote event. We are honored to be joined this afternoon by University of President Mark Schlissel, who will be making some closing remarks, as well as by UM Regent uh, Andrea Fisher Newman, Noonan? Newman? Sorry. Oh, gosh. I'm so sorry, Andrea. Um, and by Vice President Tim Lynch, who serves as our general counsel. And, of course, by all of you. Finally, it's my pleasure to give a tip of the hat to our colleagues in the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. On behalf of all of us in the LSA Dean's Office and around the college, especially our interim dean, Elizabeth Cole, and then to introduce very briefly today's panelists, uh, and for whom you can find uh, larger bios in the printed program. First, we're pleased to welcome William Cristal, who is founder and editor of large of the Weekly Standard, who appears frequently on all the leading political commentary shows. Before starting at the Weekly Standard in 1995, Mr. Cristal led the project for the Republican future where he helped to shape the strategy that produced the 1994 Republican congressional victory. We're also really very pleased to welcome Neera Tandon, who is president and CEO of the Center for American Progress and the CEO of the Center for American Progress Action Fund. Before joining uh, those organizations, she worked as a key member of the health and reform team for, the, for former President Barack Obama where she helped to develop and pass the Affordable Care Act. And then finally, um, we'll, today's uh, panel will be moderated by Michael Barr, 
who most of you probably know as the John and Stanford Wheel, Weil, oh, Dean of Public Policy at the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. He's also the Frank Murphy Collegiate Professor of Public Policy and the Roy F. and Jean Humphrey Prophet Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. He also serves as the Faculty Director of the Center on Finance, Law, um, and Policy at the University of Michigan. And it's my pleasure uh, to turn things over to Dean Barr to get us started. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Angela, uh, for that terrific framing of our conversation today. And thanks for all of you uh, for being here today for this terrific uh, conference and this uh, keynote event. Um, let me also uh, thank our uh, distinguished um, uh, guests from uh, the Regents, uh, Executive Officers, uh, and President Mark Schlissel uh, for being here today. I also wanted to thank uh, our provost, uh, Martin Filbert, who couldn't be with us uh, this afternoon, but I really want to thank him for his vision and uh, also, frankly, financial support um, for this uh, terrific series um, that we're conducting. And also a, a big thanks to our Ford School committee member, Jim Hudak, um, for sponsoring and supporting We Listen's work, uh, including this conference today. As Angela said, this is a kickoff event for us in a program we're calling Conversations Across Difference. And part of it is about having the kind of conversations that we're going to hear uh, today. It's also about working with our students uh, and with groups like We Listen to help uh, train and support the activity going on on campus um, that uh, helps students and faculty, all of us, um, learn how to listen better to each other and how to talk across our differences and to work together on trust building, um, actually uh, doing projects in the world to build trust. And lastly, an important part of the uh, Conversations Across Difference initiative uh, is about fostering a real generous sense of belonging, uh, not trying to draw narrow boundaries around each other, but to really bring uh, everybody uh, inside. And uh, let me thank um, Barry Rabe. Um, uh, point correctly, um, who is our faculty lead on our Conversations Across Difference initiative for, um, for his work in this. And um, of course, um, let me give a, a special thanks to, um, to Allie and to Nick um, for their leadership of We Listen, uh, really doing phenomenal work last year and now this year in the leadership uh, chair roles. And you'll be able to see their talents asking questions mm -hmm. um, in just a moment. So. Uh, after an initial conversation that I'm going to guide for uh, a while, we'll turn things over to all of you. You all have index cards to fill out. Um, those of you who are watching uh, online can send us questions on Twitter. And um, Nick and um, uh, Allie, with Barry's uh, assistance, will be uh, gathering your questions and bringing them into a format that we can um, ask our panelists um, uh, uh, together. So. Um, with that, let me just um, uh, begin our discussion uh, by thanking um, Bill and Neera uh, for being here. Um, they're both <coughs> unbelievably uh, busy people uh, <laughs> flying uh, all over uh, the country to do this. But as soon as I asked them to come to this event, they both said yes right away. And it wasn't because I asked, let me assure you. It was because of all of you. It was because of the work that uh, We Listen is doing bringing people together uh, on campus and around the country. It really is a powerful, powerful model um, for our students. Uh, so let me, um, uh, let me just uh, start with maybe an open-ended open conversation. We're going to do this very informally, um, an open-ended kind of conversation. So you both come from very different uh, political traditions um, and backgrounds. Um, Maybe I'll ask Nira to start since Bill's uh, uh, trying to get a little water. No, there is. Um, Too much when water. You, when you think <laughs> about when you think about uh, Bill, what are the? I'm not sure you really want to go there. You know, uh, so, uh, despite the capital here, he's going to have very little privacy here. You know? I'm going. Um, when you think about Bill, what are the things, the areas of kind of common values that you mm -hmm. think about, or common areas of 
agreement that you use as a bridge to have conversations with each other? Yeah, I think um, I, think I find that not hard to answer, actually, <laughs> which is uh, I think that uh, there are really two areas that I hope we have uh, areas of common ground. One is a belief in the core values of a democracy, meaning rule of law, commitment to free speech, support of minority rights. I mean, these are issues that I don't really think were in big debate, but actually are in real debate in our country and real debate in Washington politics. And so I have huge respect for people, particularly Bill, who um, whose adherence to those principles in this moment um, are calling on him to uh, sometimes disagree with his party. And I think that that is something that uh, progressives really should, and I do, value uh, and respect. And so I think that's a particularly important arena. And then I think on issues around, some issues around national security and believing in uh, democratic principles as they relate to foreign policy and opposing authoritarianism and opposing kind of creeping populism that undermines democracy itself. That those are two areas where I see, where I think that um, you know, perhaps there's a real common ground. But I think a final area, um, and this is related to the democracy point, is you know, I think that there is a um, nature to our politics, which is really, there's visions of politics at play today. And one vision of politics is, is based on dividing people against each other and um, sowing political victory at the, uh, through um, sort of intense division. And, uh, you know, I think all of us have engaged in political fights back and forth, but the level of defining some group of people as not really American is, is a danger for democracy itself. And I think Bill has been great in standing up to for democratic principles, but against a kind of politics that um, that tries to turn us against each other, and I think that is fundamentally the most central question in the United States today, which is our, whether our politics will continue down a path, kind of tearing at the fabric of the country, or we'll figure out some path to try to solve these wounds that are seem to be multiplying uh, as we speak. I mean, I would just uh, well, thank you for those kind words, and I would reciprocate them all, but it would take, <laughs> kill another five minutes, so I'll just stipulate <laughs> that they're, they're understood to apply uh, on my behalf to, to Nira. I, I also want to congratulate you all on your big victory last night at Northwestern. <laughs> I landed, I left Austin yesterday morning, and I told someone there that I was a good luck charm, and Texas would break. I had some, it had lost like, I don't know, five times in a row at Kansas State or something like that, and sure enough, they won, and then I landed here, and Michigan was behind, and had a nice comeback. Because I'm old enough to remember when Michigan would have regarded a game at Northwestern as kind of a joke game. You know? <laughs> it's a tiny little private school that's in the Big Ten, by, as it then was, by accident. And, and, uh, but it's okay. So times change. Northwestern's become, I guess, a pretty good football school. And uh, so anyway, congratulations on that. Of course, the most important result of the weekend was Harvard's tragic loss to Rhode Island on Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> Ruining the undefeated season after uh, in the third game. Um, I just had one thing to one nearest that I think, and I think all three of us actually have this in common, which is we all served in government. Mm -hmm. And I do think if you've served in government, this isn't universally true, but somewhat true, that you do have just more of a sense of the complexity of things and that many of these decisions are not black and white in terms of public policy. There are pluses and minuses to most policies. There are authentic disagreements about both about values, but also about just how certain things are going to work or not work. And, and, uh, and so I think it makes one a little, I certainly personally was this way. I came to Washington reasonably young, but I had taught a little bit, including at a public policy school. Mm -hmm. And I was much less certain of what I, of, not so much of what I believed, but of my ability to sort of understand how well certain or badly certain policies would work mm -hmm. once I had been in government for, I guess, seven years or so in the Reagan and second term and then the first Bush administration than before I got there. So I think that's something that also adds a, a kind of humility maybe to, to one's confidence that one is always right about everything. And that's why I think a good public policy school actually, uh, both at the undergraduate level and certainly at the graduate level, that's one of the very important things it can teach. People always, I, when I taught at the Kennedy School for a couple of years, which was comparable to this obviously, there was always, students would sometimes, I would always say at the beginning, 
I was only a couple of years, but I would say, I hope you leave the school less confident in the sense mm -hmm. that you know what to do, not more confident, which is in a way contrary to why people are paying these excessive tuitions. But, uh, <laughs> not here, of course, just, just at the Kennedy School. But, um, but, uh, but I think that's an important aspect of it, of it too. But I think having said that, one really has to be sort of much more confident in and hard line about, if you want, certain basic characteristics of liberal democratic government home, I would say personally also of the, uh, preserving the liberal order abroad, and really a respect, and this I think you want to get some government to, a respect for the forms and processes mm -hmm. of government and of a civilized society. These things don't, they can be frustrating, they can be overdone, things can get too legalistic, too bureaucratic, too whatever, but uh, really you look around the world and you appreciate a lot of these kind of boring due mm. process, rule of law, you know, yeah, conflict, right, <laughs> sort of basic things that one takes for granted and quibbles about here on the margins, but really a, a country that doesn't have those things and doesn't respect those things uh, can get into a lot of trouble quite quickly. I'm going to come back to that theme at the end. I think it's really quite important. I, I thought I might spend a little bit of time teasing out some potential differences or areas of agreement in a couple different areas just to, to lead us off. Uh, maybe we'll uh, start with immigration. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow We Listen's lead and only <coughs> ask about areas of extreme um, debate. So, <laughs> and work Great. through it. And work Great. through it. So immigration. Bill, you've, you've written a lot about immigration over your career. Your views, I think, have evolved quite a bit right. uh, over your career. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about that evolution and then how you think about say, the DACA issues today? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was never an issue I was that involved in. I just that wasn't the part of government I worked in. And when I was in government, Reagan signed the 86 bill, and I was at the Education Department, and then first Bush administration. I don't actually, George H.W. Bush administration, I don't really recall it being a hugely contentious issue. So it's not something I sort of was in the middle of huge fights over. And then by 06, 07, when there were the big fights in Congress. I was pretty much with Bush and McCain and the attempt to get a bipartisan bill through. I, I, I soured on that a little bit. I think partly there were some problems with the bill. I was a little moved by the economist's argument that there really was, in this respect, I think I was right to be worried about something that Trump then exploited, that there really was downward pressure on working class wages, that, that some of that pressure did come from a lot of low wage uh, immigrants coming in. I mean, that's just, an, I think, a pretty much of a you know, economic fact almost. I mean, globalization plus mass immigration puts a lot of pressure on working class wages in this country and in other advanced countries. Uh, and I was worried about that and worried both about it, obviously, in terms of the actual economics, but also in terms of the political implications of that. Um, having said that, I, I myself have been radicalized to the left on immigration in the last two years because whatever disputes you can have there's no you know there's no magic number that says 1.5 1.7 1.2 is the right million people is the right number of immigrants to have right and there's no magic number that says exactly how they should be distributed or what mix of family unification and certain kinds of skills or uh, other metrics or, you know you should drive your educate your immigration system by but i think with trump and with the appeals he made one has to, it was, I thought, important, and I really believe this, I mean, I just felt this, one has to rally to the principle of, you know, that we're all equal, as Lincoln said, whether you're, the, in his case, the, the grandson or granddaughter, in our case, the great, 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 great grandson and granddaughter of people who signed the declaration or, is here, or were here before the declaration, or whether you came over, uh, or whether you're the son, daughter of immigrants, or whether you came over as an immigrant and had become a citizen, or on your way to becoming a citizen, that we're all equal, we're all equally, uh, as Lincoln put it, uh, with blood of the blood, you know, uh, of those who signed the declaration. And so uh, that principle really is important, I think. When Trump, for me, the moment, uh, the POW comment about McCain, I think it was one of the worst moments for me for, for Trump. But really the Mexican judge mm -hmm. comment was in a way the most offensive thing he said, the one that cuts most fundamentally against American principles. And the fact that he didn't pay much of a price for that mm -hmm. unnerved me about Republican primary voters. Uh, and I've probably become, therefore, more, as uh, so I say, kind of insistent on, again, whatever policy dispute we can have down the road about numbers and so forth. One has to have the principle that, uh, of, of being equal respect for all Americans, immigrants or not. And then as a practical matter, I'd say I've been somewhat moved by the arguments 
of the, some people that actually just as an empirical matter, uh, immigrants are doing, the, the downward pressure on wages is a slight negative, but there's a huge number of positives that immigrants bring. And then finally DACA, I mean, there just needs to be an obvious fairness issue, and it's kind of crazy not to uh, legalize uh, and give a path to citizenship to people who've been here for 10 or 20 or 30 years. Yeah, so I mean, just to just to say a few words um, in response, and I think I think there are progressives uh, who have been concerned about downward pressure on wages that happen from a whole host of forces, globalization, technology, and I think we should be truly analytic about uh, immigration and what that means. Um, and I think the data has sort of changed a little bit on yep. on some of these points over <coughs> over the years. I think. I think the so there's obviously a lot of issues around rhetoric that um, that Bill referenced, but I think also you know if you look at the policy over the last year and a half, I think what's concerning is uh, a real effort to limit legal immigration, and I mean this the administration. I, I think it's actually been really clarifying that the administration, which had a lot of rhetoric about quote unquote illegal immigration and and Mexican gangs and all that stuff has actually, you know, adopted a policy to address, to redress and cha fundamentally change legal immigration and to be seemingly more hostile to country immigrants from countries that tend to be people of color and more positive towards immigrants that can, that te mm -hmm. tend to be from countries that are mostly white and. I think that has, to some degree, unmasked the racialized nature of this immigration debate. And for a lot of people, it was always unmasked. Um, but uh, you know, I think in the the weird thing about the debates we have in Washington is it can be some like, obvious point, but then you go on cable TV and someone will argue these points. <laughs> and but I think really the fact that the administration has been pushing towards uh, 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 basically a, a of immigration policies that seem to indicate that, and the rhetoric too, that seems to indicate that um, you know people of color are just not as welcome. And I'll say, what was, I've been in politics for a really long time. I've been in lots of presidential campaigns. I've fought with Bill Kristol numerous times on cable <laughs> during the Obama years. <coughs> I never, I mean, I've been online. I tweet probably way too much, but I've, ne I've never had the experience that I had in 2016, which is like people would go online and basically say that I should go back to India or, or basically communicate in some form or another that I'm not truly American because I'm Indian or I'm brown. That never happened to me until the 2016 campaign. Just never happened, really. Um, and I think that that is a, I think that, you know, I think the moment we're in, in politics is the country is really struggling over very basic questions, more basic questions than we've ever struggled about before. And one of those questions is, who is truly American? You know, and we can have, a, there's an expansive vision of that, uh, or an inclusive vision of that, or I think that in contention is a very exclusive vision of that. and. Um, and I think that's one of the really core debates and why I think this moment in time in politics is more important than any moment of time that I've been engaged in and why you know, these debates are so central and why it's important to try and bridge these debates but also recognize that there are core values that we are fighting for. So Bill, what's your view on that? Do we have a, a chance of having the kind of debate that would let us see our common humanity in the way that both of you have described? Is there a chance of Democrats and Republicans coming together, for example, around Dreamer legislation? How do you, how do you see this moment we're in right now? You know, I think, I think it's actually a little more chance than, than people would suspect, looking at Washington right now, of some compromises next year. Mm -hmm. I can sort of imagine scenarios where maybe leadership doesn't even want to, but where backbenchers of both mm -hmm. parties decide, I didn't come to Washington just to be a rubber stamp for party leadership or an ineffectual protester mm -hmm. against party leadership. And you could actually get, I mean, obviously there, there's enough common ground in some of these areas like dreamers that it wouldn't be hard in a sense to, it's not like it's intellectually difficult to write the legislation. It's just a question of getting the votes and then getting the signature. And Trump might sign things next year that he doesn't sound like he would sign today after a different election result. I do think, so I'm off, and I really do admire what you all have done here in terms of seeking for 
uh, common ground and having uh, you know, civil and rational discussion across issues. I would also say, and this is in a way nearest point though, that one also has to sort of rule, I won't say rule certain things out of bound, but bounds, but one has to be tough against certain things, I mm -hmm. think. So I'm not really interested in going on Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson began at the Weekly Standard in 1995 as a 23-year-old, extremely talented journalist. If you go back and look at the pieces he wrote from 95 to 2000 for us, some really wonderful, colorful sort of set pieces about the circus of politics and, and so forth. Uh, he always had a sort of ironic uh, eye. He always had a touch of paleoconservatism, I would say. Mm -hmm. He was a little too nice to Pat Buchanan for my taste a couple of times, but not, mm -hmm. not a personally bigoted person and not a person who sat around, believe me, at the Weekly Standard office or anywhere else, you know, on kind of ethno-nationalist, expressing ethno-nationalist sentiments. And you see that show today, and it's really shocking. And that is a problem. I mean, there's just no question that on the evening on Fox News now, you have real, you are st it's making it worse. I mean, it's always been there. There have always been these sentiments there. People always ask me, you know, well, wasn't the Republican Party always this way? Trump's just exposing something that was there. Of course, there's some truth to that. But it was there, but it was repressed in a sense. Buchanan got his 20, 25% of the vote in New Hampshire and, and then faded away and ultimately left the party in 99, 2000. And Bush, to his credit, actually sort of drove him out of the party almost. Ron Paul got his votes in 08 and 12, but went nowhere. Uh, when Trump was a birther in 2011, 12, Romney, is a mistake in my opinion, you know, did actually accept his endorsement, remember that, on, on stage. Mm -hmm. But it was like eight minutes and they did it as quickly as they could and they got him off stage. And I was on Fox, I remember, I can't remember if it was that night or the Sunday afterwards, maybe Fox News Sunday, and said it was a, they shouldn't have even given him that much credibility. Romney just should have refused to appear with him. And everyone agreed, it wasn't, but anyway, no one was pushing. <laughs> That was a tactical question of whether you have to kind of accommodate a little bit of, you know, but, but no one was p believed it was respectable to make those arguments. The fact that, that the equivalent arguments today are respectable uh, among a chunk of uh, the media, and then, of course, social media has changed the dynamics, mm -hmm. and among elected officials is a huge problem. And the biggest problem is the President of the United States mm -hmm. uh, reinforces that. I mean, I really, you know, a lot of things can be unpleasant, recessive genes yeah. in a population. And in a political in a political system, yeah. and, and they're always going to be there. It's 330 million people here. Not everyone's going to be a wonderful, tolerant, you know, forward-looking, enlightened Except person. Except school or university. <laughs> right. yeah. But a president who reinforces those sentiments, exacerbates the divisions, appeals to prejudice, is the president. I mean, it makes things a lot worse. And for me, that's always been what's most alarming about Trump: stuff that's always been there but sort of marginalized can become central and very damaging. Mm -hmm. Vanir, how do you think about dealing with that um, fringe, what used to be a fringe argument that's now been brought into this media and, and Republican conversation? How do you position yourself? How do you think strategically about it um, in terms of how you, you fight against views that you think are or shouldn't be in that, in that conversation? Yeah, so I think, you know, like I, the way I guess I think about this is there's, there's policy debates in the country, and we should definitely engage on policy debates in the country, but on and sort of core value, core issues like, you know, whether we're all American or whether we should have democratic <laughs> institutions or whether, like, a free press is a good thing. Um, I think you just, I mean, my take on this is essentially we have to defeat these these ideas at the ballot box, or we have to, def we have to create a... Uh, an objection and uh, an opposition. And I'd say one interesting thing about the country that I'm, you know, somewhat optimistic about, I'll say after after the election, um, our national security team literally looked at Orban in, in Hungary <laughs> because, you know, there's a right-wing populist who took power and then, like, really uh, amassed power. I mean, went after the judiciary. And, you know, it's easier, for sure, when you're in a parliamentary system to overrun <coughs> Uh, opposition, but one of the things that was really interesting is that when you really study what happened in Hungary, is that the you know the the opposition was really overwhelmed, shocked, depressed, diffuse, really like are you know obviously had vicious internal debates, but mostly receded until and then you know he basically took over, started with the attacks on the judiciary, and then went after the press, um, and has you know passed a law that basically changed the voting structure, so it was really hard to get him out now. Um, and so, 
you know, what happened in our country was very different, you know, and I think of something important to think through, which is the day after Donald Trump was elected, there was a mass uprising in the country, the largest, um, the largest uh, protests uh, in, in our country's history. And I'll say, as a leader of the progressive cause, that was a very grassroots-oriented protest. There were three protests planned in January. One was an immigration march, one was a health care march, and one was a women's march. And we could see online... November, December, the Women's March was really just growing and growing. Women's marches were growing and growing in intensity. And I think if you really step back at the last year and a half, so many of the debates we're having are really hitting cultural touch points. And the fact that we are going to go into the midterms into, like, you know, we're uh, 37 days from the midterms. But who's, but who's counting? But who's counting? <laughs> um, and we're now in a big debate about, you know, essentially sexual assault and the treatment of women. I think, you know, I think that there has been a large-scale cultural response to this moment. And honestly, the women who are coming into politics and the, the, the resistance in the country is really born of women. It's women, it's a new, the new activists are really a lot of college-educated women, but really mothers coming into politics for the first time. And I think it is a reaction to these really core issues. It's, you know, the people flooding the town halls, on health care were, were women who had health care. They weren't losing health care. They had health care. But I think they were basically upset and angry about a politics that is so divisive and so willing to push people against each other and kind of really define, you know, define some group as acceptable and some group as not acceptable. And so, and, you know, I think we're still dealing with all of those issues and may well see the largest, I think we'll see the largest gender gap in a midterm. Hmm. I'd be shocked if we, did, if we didn't. And I think that's really been transforming our politics in, in really fundamental ways. So maybe we'll just use that as a segue to talk about what is probably on a lot of people's <laughs> minds. Uh, we just had a really rather extraordinary um, hearing in the Senate Judiciary Committee about uh, Supreme Court Justice nominee Brett Kavanaugh. And you both came into this uh, last few weeks of new information with, with different positions about the underlying merits of, of the Kavanaugh nomination. Uh, uh, Bill, you had written quite favorably about Kavanaugh before these sets of events. Uh, Nira had uh, really been strongly in opposition. I'm wondering if you could both tell us a little bit about what this process has meant for your views about Kavanaugh, and then more importantly about your views on the Supreme Court and its credibility and broader issues about democratic process. If you could maybe start with Brett uh, Kavanaugh and move move outward from there, and happy to have either of you dig in. You, um, well, uh, I, I would first want to just say a word about the process in the, in the Judiciary Committee. I mean, I, I think over the last year and a half, we've seen a lot of instances in which I think fundamentally the Senate is almost becoming much more like the House, where... Um, it's, you know, they got rid of the filibuster, I mean, Democrats got rid of the filibuster on judges, and then McConnell got rid of the filibuster on uh, the Supreme Court, on a Supreme Court justice. And so, but the whole, uh, the whole effort to just really push this process has been fascinating to me. So I, I will say that my entry into politics really started in 1991 during the Anita Hill hearing. So I was a college senior uh, during the Anita Hill hearings. And, um, and, and I remember going to protests. I still remember holding the sign. We will remember next November. And, you know, I was really taken, shocked by how she was treated, even by de some Democrats on that <coughs> But in that committee process, there was an FBI investigation. Where there were three days of testimony. There were multiple people testifying. Um, and, uh, and, you know, truthfully, she was talking about a harassment case and not an assault case, which I think people have sort of forgotten the, the differences in level of scope. Um, truthfully, different timing, but still. And in this case, 
I mean, I've been really surprised, and I know, I mean, I really shouldn't be surprised <laughs> being a year and a half in Washington, just that not even the rhetorical interest in saying, oh, we should get to the facts and let's open an FBI investigation at the beginning of this process. You know, a normal thing would have been this comes forward, an FBI investigation would have happened, and then you would have had the hearing and you would have multiple people. Instead, there was a big negotiation about the hearing, two people spoke, and we, and only because of the dam broke that we went in this direction. So I guess I would say, you know, what I am de sort of depressed about in this moment is just the whole debate is essentially winning or losing this nomination and not really anything about, you know, does should we get to the facts of what happened? Should we try to understand the full picture here? It was assumed on one side, you know, that she was that there couldn't be anything to this. And only I think honestly, and I think this is like a moment of some import, I really think it's the fact that two women jammed themselves in an elevator and talked about their own experience with assault that made Senator Flake, who I think acted principally here, to change this dynamic so that we have an FBI investigation. Um, and I, you know, I think hopefully we get to back to a place where we would, you know, you investigate matters, you don't just think about winning. I mean, I, I think that's like a, a huge challenge, which is that it's just everything has become like I win, like so tribal, which is like I, you lose and I win. I mean, I really think Rick Kavanaugh went into his testimony because like no nominee of any kind has ever acted that way. But his thing was like, I'm going to get everyone to hate Democrats and then I will shore up support amongst Republicans. And he could do that because it's a 50, 51 vote. So that's like what's deeply sort of depressing and upsetting about it. Um, and I hope that we can move to a place where we can kind of get rid of, get out of that level of tribalism. I mean, I hope we learn facts over the next, this coming week that, you know, it would incline a, a, a fair observer and impartial spectator to mm -hmm. move in one direction or another. I think it'd be better for the country, honestly, if, if there were, if people could come to a, if it became kind of clear that what had happened or the one or the other was, uh, not telling the truth, or maybe mm -hmm. inadvertently not, you know, not telling the truth because they didn't have recollection of something. I, I do think it's bad. Obviously, it's bad for the court. The one reason I was strongly in favor of what Senator Flake did, well, I think I would if I'd had to vote. I would have voted no. Is that I think it really will do damage. I mean, after what Kavanaugh said Thursday, just hard to see how he can be viewed as a impartial, even somewhat impartial Supreme Court justice. Now, we've had a million justices who were politicians in the old yeah. days, more of them were. We've had mm -hmm. Ruth Bader Ginsburg has said things I think, honestly, she shouldn't have said as a sitting member of the court, but we've never had anything to the, and Thomas, we got very, that was a very wrenching moment for kind of, you know, cultural, let's say, mm -hmm. reasons for many people. But Thomas didn't attack the Democratic Party or anything like that. He didn't attack George Mitchell, the majority leader of the Senate. It was a Democratic Judiciary Committee. Joe Biden made the rules for how it went ahead. He didn't and attack questioners. No, <laughs> no. I mean, and Thomas was confirmed with 11 Democratic votes. So I, that was a bad moment for the country in the sense that it, a lot of people were left very unhappy about an outcome and feeling it was kind of unfair or whatever. But he got 11 Democratic senators to vote with him. They had three days of hearings, as I recall, with uh, you know, 18 additional witnesses. And it didn't really resolve one way or the other. One felt, OK, look, we've done our best to get at this, these conflicting accounts of what happened a decade before. Um, no one really felt that way on Thursday. For me, that was the key point. I mean, it's really ridiculous. I mean, not that the FBI is going to solve everything. They report on, inc on, their inter on their questioning. They don't resolve these issues. They're not a judge and jury. They're a investigative. But the idea that Mark Judge, who was said by, uh, to have been at this particular thing and to have participated in the assault and was never interrogated by anyone, there's just something nuts about that. I mean, if this were the University of Michigan, I mean, God forbid something bad would happen, but there was an HR complaint or something like that, there would be a thorough investigation and people would talk to both sides. One of the complaints some conservatives have had, incidentally, about universities is that on some of these issues there hasn't been enough due process and the courts, in fact, have found that in some cases because you do need to talk to both sides. But okay, so talk to them and have, if you want to have people, stenographers and lawyers present, that's fine. That's all you can dispute exactly how to do this kind of thing. But the idea that you're just going to go ahead with the hearing and not have, that people are going to email in some statements from their lawyers uh, and that's it, I mean, is really crazy. So I, I do think, but I think we're in a bad place on it in the sense that I, we could well have an outcome that really uh, threatens the 
institutional standing of the court in a way I don't think Thomas Hill did. It did some damage, but it was overcome. I mean, think of it this way. Thomas Hill was 91. Since then, we had two Clinton nominees easily approved with bipartisan votes, two Bush nominees approved with less bipartisan votes, but with no huge ruckus. Uh, one Bush nominee, Harriet Myers, opposed by people like me, by conservatives, <laughs> but withdrawn and replaced by a very distinguished uh, appellate court judge, Sam Alito. Then we had two Obama nominees confirmed unproblematically, really. Mm -hmm. And we had Gorsuch, incidentally, confirmed in a, you know, a somewhat heated debate about constitutional thought, but nothing I would regard as untoward. I don't think anyone looks at the bench today and thinks, oh, Judge Justice Gorsuch somehow was, shouldn't be there, you know, or I mean, people would prefer if you're a liberal, you know, more uh, judges on the, on the liberal side and so forth. But so then that's why for me, this is a bad moment. You know, Nira and I were joking about this, we're not joking about this, we talked about this before. And, and the institutions have held pretty well in the era of Trump. Congress, I think, less so because the Republican Party has been so pathetic in Congress. Um, but the other institutions of American government, federalism, civil society, you could argue this is why we're not Hungary, really. We have hundreds mm -hmm. of years. We don't deserve much credit for it, any of us in this room. But hmm. you know, our ancestors have, have um, and previous generations of Americans created institutions which have quite a lot of depth in America and sort of ability to withstand some demagoguery and some uh, appeals to nasty elements of populism and so forth. Uh, but I do think this has now done, the courts I would have put in the category of institutions that were doing well. Hmm. I mean, liberals didn't like Trump's appellate appointments and they maybe regretted getting rid of the fellow roster, but at the end of the day, most of them are very distinguished judges and law professors and no one really, you know, it was, it was the normal oscillation in terms of the character of the appellate judges and even district court judges. And then suddenly to have this Really, if this got, had gotten rammed through yesterday, I think it would have done a lot of damage, and it may still do damage a week from now. I, I guess I, I would say two things about this, which is to, to, to make the point that it's not just Trump. So I do think a big challenge for these debates going forward is the fact that Merrick Garland didn't get a, a, yeah, didn't, get a, didn't get a hearing of any kind, and that a rule just was created of a whole cloth, which is that, you know, he was, he didn't, just because it was Obama's last year, he didn't get a vote. And I think McConnell's doing that, uh, really, that, that kind of, another example of sort of will to power, I get to do this because I control things, really uh, makes, you know, and I think this is the challenge of the spiral, which is, you know, essentially, uh, there's a view amongst lots of liberals and progressives and Democrats that Republicans change the rules, and we adhere. You know, they adhere to the Democrats adhere to the rules. Republicans change the rules, and so that pushes to take even more extreme action. And I do think that people, you know, it is absolutely the case that um, although Gorsuch went to Georgetown Prep <laughs> and has a remarkably similar experience to uh, Brett Kavanaugh I had a very, was handled very differently, but I think that what happened, you know, it's not just Trump who is uh, doing these kinds of things. Um, the other, but I, to, to take a, have a moment of optimism um, is one thing I, I do think is that what's interesting about this moment, particularly for me in politics, is that there are so many people running for office mm -hmm. who are coming from outside the political process. There are Iraq veterans or small business owners you are not, you know, going through the traditional path. I mean, some are of being like a state legislator and then running for as a member of Congress or people who have had service in the <coughs> country. Many people have worked, you know, at the Pentagon or uh, at the State Department or just, you know, s traditional, s traditional veterans. And they're just coming a lot, an un like the highest number of women running, uh, and I do think those people, when they go to Congress, are going to be focused on trying to solve problems. I think it's very much part of their campaigns that they are coming into, you know, politics isn't the thing that's driving them every day. It is to try and solve problems. So I do think that there'll be opportunities on maybe infrastructure or other areas where um, at least you'll see an interest in passing bills uh, that can, you know, garner support. And whether Trump supports those or not, you know, it'll be a really interesting period because it'll be like the first time in many years that, you, you know, if you have a Democratic House, they're facing a Republican president who's running for re-election. So I think it'll be a very interesting dynamic about whether people want to solve problems or will be on a continual path of 
just bitter partisanship, mm -hmm. um, which is what we've seen so far. I mean, I, yeah, I, I actually very bullish on the, let's call it the 9-11 generation in terms of younger vets and people mm -hmm. also in other aspects of uh, government service and public service coming to Congress. And there have been many from, both, well, many from both parties, Democrats maybe a little more this year, but it's been a year for, <laughs> easier for Democrats to recruit people <coughs> to tell them they should take a shot and go through everything you have to go through for running for office, but that's fine. And, and I'm glad they have, honestly, because I think they will be, a lot of them will be good, good members. I've been very, a young woman I know, uh, very staunch Republican and conservative, sort of by accident went to a session where they had four or five Democratic women running for Congress on a panel. It was, mm -hmm. a, new people was invited. It wasn't a secret thing or anything. It was a public thing. So uh, she went and just, and she was really impressed by them. I mean, she's still a conservative Republican. She doesn't agree with them on probably most issues. But so that I think is a good sign. And I think there's some good signs. This year's a hard year for Republicans, but some good signs on the Republican side. I would say one of the crazy things about the Kavanaugh thing, just for a sort of stand back and look at it point of view is I can see why Democrats are very upset about Garland. But she really kind of lost, uh, that seat was filled by a, by a Republican uh, appointee, a uh, Trump appointee. I mean, it's not as if, if Kavanaugh withdrew today, Trump would nominate yeah. Joan Larson Tuesday or something like that, or Amy Conan Barrett, or, or I assume he would nominate a woman. He might have been wise to do that three months ago. Some of us urged, urged that on our <laughs> friends. I mean, just as a practical political matter, it seems kind of nuts that all the Republicans on the court are, are men. And um, so uh, but he'll nominate someone like that. It's, I think he still has a good chance of getting that person through maybe not before the election, but in late, or, or through a new Senate. It's not as if the new Senate, A, it could well be Republican. And B, it's not as if I don't think they're going to hold someone up who's well qualified for two years if there are 48 or 49 Republican senators. I think it'll be tough to do. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, what are we fighting? It's one thing, I mean, I understand we're fighting about, and I don't mean to, you know, if Judge Kavanaugh feels incredibly unfairly treated, he's entitled to make his case and so forth. But it is sort of funny that it's not as if people are talking about it as if, if Kavanaugh is, is, goes, you know, does not become a Supreme Court justice. That, somehow the Democrats get to make the next appointment, which is <laughs> not, not which is not the case. Worst case, you just have an eight person court for a while, you know, for two years, right? I mean <laughs> not to be super cynical about it, but Judge Kavanaugh is uh, is, is extraordinary in his views on presidential powers. Unusual Unusual for you think amongst, that's why Trump uh, was interested. unusual amongst <laughs> conservative jurists for the view that a president cannot be subpoenaed. I mean, it is he has a he has a different view than Judge Larson or Judge Barrett or Judge Kimmy Barrett yeah, well, on the particular and oddly enough, weirdly, this is the guy chosen for the uh, sort of <laughs> uh, perspective that a president who I don't know facing an independent counsel could not be subpoenaed by that counsel, would not need to testify, is basically impervious to any form of judicial restraint because of extraordinary presidential powers. It's unusual. I mean, just, just oddly enough, he picked that guy and is fighting tooth and nail for that guy, which, of course, makes no sense. Two weeks ago, they could have even put Amy Comey Barrett at it. Yeah. She would have had more support on the right hmm. than Kavanaugh, yeah. who's, just to be clear, is extremely incredibly unpopular for a nominee. It's, it's extraordinary. The last person as popular or unpopular as Kavanaugh, right. even before this, was Harriet Myers, and she was bold. So it's not, you know, this is what's, I mean, I hate to be cynical, but of course, this is what Trump requires, which is for you to think through, perhaps there is some um, effort to save his own skin in this determination. I mean, the, the nicer version of this was that, you know, he was a good friend of McGann's and highly respected in the DC legal community. But it is true. I mean, every political person I talked to in the week or two weeks after yeah. Kennedy's retirement was announced and when the, all the speculation was going about the pick, every political person I know said, well, there are two obvious things. A woman would be better than a man. Now, maybe they're not quite ready yet. They haven't been on the bench long enough, so fine. But at least you'd want to take a close look at the, at the female candidates who were on the list or maybe not on the list, since that's kind of an artificial thing. To, uh, but whatever, Trump had decided to do that, to, to circumscribe himself with the Federalist Society list. Uh, but there were plenty of, there were several, well, several women on it, well-qualified, well-thought of women, Scalia clerks and so forth. And two, given that eight, the, current, the, the, the eight justices then sitting had all gone to what, Harvard and Yale Law School, I think. I mean, maybe it would be nice to have someone from some other, you know, part of the country and didn't simply look, and in fact, it, there was a nice, over, there were many well, very well-regarded jurists, Ray Kethledge, a lot of friends of mine were pushing for when he made that final four. 
uh, Larson, Alice and Hyde. I mean, McConnell you know, pushed who for did, somebody else. Who didn't go? McConnell's uh, uh, pushed for this younger judge in uh, Sixth Circuit, I think. Yeah, so there were plenty of people. So it is, I mean, I will say that that fits into your theory that you sort of had to go out of your way to get to Kavanaugh as the, as the pick, just from a sort of straight, assuming they're all qualified, assuming yeah. they're all perfectly going to be perfectly distinguished justices, which I don't and think he's anyone. And a Bush guy. So also, yeah. he doesn't like well, that. Yeah. So maybe you're right. That's why Trump did that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> On uh, that note, I'm going to ask uh, Ali and Nick to um, start uh, collecting and asking the questions <laughs> from the audience. OK, thank you both so much. So we're going to go ahead and get started with a question that's particularly salient to us being on a public university's campus. And that's regarding the role of universities in establishing robust conversations that bring different ideological viewpoints into the conversation. So how do you view the role of the, of the university in that? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just, I'm, I'd say when I was in grad school, I studied political philosophy. I was never really a libertarian. and. Indeed, was intrigued by sort of more conservative, let's say, not just conservative, but communitarian and other arguments that are on the limits of pure libertarianism. I've got to say, in practice, I've become much more straightforwardly libertarian. I just think once you go down the road of limiting speech, except for the obvious extreme cases, of, uh, it really is a very slippery slope. And I guess I don't trust the uh, guardians of our different institutions or political figures or any figures, really. I mean, obviously, private institutions have their own rights, which public different from public institutions, and colleges and universities are different from some business that's having a conference and so forth. But I would say even private universities, though I think legally they might be in a somewhat different standing, I'm very averse to, uh, to limiting speech, except in some really extreme circumstances. I just think it's, it's dangerous. And I think if you just look empirically, we had a couple of good articles on this in the standard Europe, where they have tried to do much more in the way of hate speech legislation, has mostly backfired. And in fact, if you look at Europe, it's not a very happy story right now of tolerance and of uh, lack of bigotry. So I would be, I am sort of an old fashioned Justice Brandeis, sunlight is the best disinfectant kind of liberal on this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I sort of took the question more broadly, but I mean, I, I agree in um, essentially the importance of free speech, and I'm definitely a believer that the best response to intolerant speech is more speech of a different of tolerant speech. Although I definitely feel there are moments where Trump's Twitter feed actually like overwhelms me. So um, I, I think though I, I think a broader question is how important um, universities and facts are in this crazy moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was telling this story a little bit earlier. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll just confess that after Trump was elected, I definitely had some existential moments about the role of think tanks and the importance of facts and, like, whether it actually mattered in the debate that, uh, you know, there were facts on one side and, and emotions on another. But <coughs> what's been, I, I think, actually really interesting and important for the role we all play is, um, you know, Trump is himself and he's a sort of, unto himself, but in terms of the debates in Congress, facts actually still do really matter. On the Affordable Care Act, I'll just say, CAP has worked, uh, you know, worked relatively strenuously to defend the ACA, and you know, Trump and the re many Republicans in Congress said the versions of the bill that they put forward would not reduce health care coverage, that people would keep their health care coverage. In fact, House Republicans as well as the White House attacked the Congressional Budget Office weeks before they were coming out with their analysis that 23 million people would lose health care coverage. But throughout that debate, especially <coughs> at the end, you know, 65, 70 percent of Americans believed that people would lose health care coverage because they saw lots of facts and figures that people would lose health care coverage. And that was a driving force to why the bill was defeated. And Despite the fact that you know politicians say something over and over again, I mean there is a there is a real problem that uh, part of Trump's base or part of the Republican Party do just seem to believe what he says. But for the majority of Americans, I do think facts are really important. I think actually uh, the, a university <coughs> and its adherence to facts and its adherence to data, like we have to fight for that more than ever. And. Um, and, you know, I do think ultimately having a persuasive argument and grounding it in reality 
is, you know, we have to figure out ways that we communicate with people who are different from ourselves, but it is really vital that we stay there. And I'll just make one slightly more, slightly conservative point, just so we have a little bit of, uh, you know, <laughs> tweak some of the liberals here. No, I mean, I spoke at Harvard right after, I think in January of 17, so right after the president was inaugurated or about to be, and it was one of these big panels, university-wide, you know, existential crisis of our times, what are we going to do about it, you know, facts, truth, all this kind of stuff. And it was fine. But I, I couldn't resist beginning my remarks by thanking, by, you know, saying that people at Harvard Law School should be very pleased that they have been teaching, of course, about the living constitution. But not just that. Critical legal studies was teaching about how you know, the rule of law, that's just a fiction that, of course, the, you know, the ruling class portrays. There's no such thing as abstract or, or, artif or uh, neutral principles. That was all left way behind in the, what, 60s and 70s. I mean, you were a law professor, I would say, Ron Fuller and all that stuff. And everyone, all the hip stuff, a lot of I it, mean, least. maybe they were and right, we, Bill. No, 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 but I mean, I said, they, 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 Trump agreed with them. Trump agrees they, that the rule of law, everything's a matter of power, everything's a matter of, it's not really a matter of facts or of, or of evidence. And I also <laughs> congratulated the literature departments of Harvard for being pleased now that they had a president who agreed with them also that simple-minded notions of truth and all that are out of date, and now it's a question of narratives or like the, the modern historians. And I, I'm overstating, obviously. But I, I actually do think... gotten to the deep state. Yeah, but I do think... Well, the deep state was Trump picked up from left-wing political scientists, actually, which was and not a stupid idea, incidentally, about countries like... Turkey and Indonesia, which is kind of what it was actually yeah. meant to explain. So, but there is a way which I do think, so Nero was being a little upbeat before about the kind of people running for office. I'm a little upbeat about a certain recognition on both the right and the left of, you know what, I mean, let's cool it a little bit with all the super clever, you know, derived from Nietzsche and Heidegger and Foucault and whatever, you know, <laughs> postmodernism and, and cleverly showing that people's perspectives dominate everything. And let's remember that if you, A, it's probably not correct theoretically, I don't think, but B, if you want a sort of decent society where people can actually work together and live together, there is some, something to be said for a slightly more old-fashioned view of truth and facts and, and evidence. And I, th I think you see some of that on both sides. I'm upset on the right, on the other hand, and here's where I'm not, I'm not quite as complacent. For all the reaction among you know, me and my friends against Trump, there's a certain intellectual strain on the right, which is, goes beyond Bannon now, that's yeah. really somewhat hostile to liberal democracy, hmm. and not in a sort of very theoretical way, which is fine. I mean, sort of, you have to understand the price we pay for modern capitalism, alienation. You know, there's, there's always been a very sophisticated critique on left and right of certain limitations of modern liberal democracy, which is fine, but are genuinely willing to go the next step and sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater, and you see that among some thinkers, and I worry that that could become attractive. We could get in a spiral where this would be like the 20s and 30s, where what happened in the world of the intellect uh, parallels what happened in real politics, which is everyone just got sick of kind of old-fashioned, boring liberalism, liberalism with a little L, you know, and, and everyone got entranced by all kinds of uh, narratives that were contemptuous of just things like due process, rule of law, tolerance and so forth. That would be a very bad place to go. Yeah, and I'll just say briefly on this because I know we want to get to other questions. I, I think we should really think consciously about what's happening in our country and also in other countries. Yeah. That it is not, you know, it is not that these forces are just happening in the United States in a vacuum. They're not just happening intellectually in the United States in a vacuum. The, the intellectual arguments that you're seeing are, are even stronger in Europe. There is much greater contention between, uh, a, you know, I think Trump is sort of a weird figure in his right. apparently being in love with Kim Jong-un, um, uh, but really in regards to Putin and the sort of the support for Putinism. But in Europe, you know, there is a much broader, you know, war within the public in terms of its, their supports for authoritarianism um, and the mixture of just virulent, you know, open racism and xenophobia with um, these things. And I think just to say this, like we used to think Berlusconi was the craziest person in Italy or in Europe, actually. And now they're, you know, there are literal fascists in the government of Italy. And, you know, there is no reason. I mean, I think the most important thing for all generations to recognize is that we have too often believed democracy is just status quo and that it will always be this way. And I believe this, the 21st century is going to be a deep contention between authoritarianism, whether it's from China or Russia, 
and sort of the, the liberal de democratic norms that we all believe in. And I think the fact that we've just been sort of lazy about these things for generations, really since the Cold War, um, has allowed you know, Putin a lot of success in his efforts to delegitimize democracy around the world. And I just, since we're just adding things, I mean, I very much agree with that. <laughs> no, but I, this is appropriate for an academic environment, I think. In addition to the norms, which are the, you know, obviously one has to hang on to and really reiterate and defend, I would say going back and thinking more in the way the founders did and others, other founders of other uh, liberal democracies, post World War II and, and, and Germany and Italy and elsewhere, um, Japan, thinking seriously about the institutions and the structures. Mm -hmm. And I think there are aspects of this that fit into more liberal policies, honestly, in terms of, well, just, and other aspects that fit into more <laughs> conservative policies in terms of limiting, for example, the scope of government. But thinking seriously about, well, what are the institutional structures we have, both in government and out of government, uh, in terms of free markets, civil society, uh, not-for-profit institutions, colleges and universities, that provide bulwarks against you know, a wave of demagoguery sweeping over the public sector, hopefully for only a few years, but maybe for more than a few years. Mm -hmm. and, and other countries don't have such bulwarks. And I think, so it's partly a matter of the attachment to the norms, it's partly a matter of the actual institutional infrastructure, so to speak, which we're pretty fortunate to have. Not that we should take it for granted, you know, uh, and which other countries, uh, I would have said, I actually am surprised at how weak they've turned, it's turned out mm -hmm. to be though in some of these other countries. Yeah. And that's worrisome, I think. Yeah. All right, so this question asks about the role of the press in our democracy. So a few weeks ago, Chuck Todd penned a piece speaking to the role of the press in the current state of affairs. And in response, David French of the National Review wrote that news organizations should assume more responsibility <coughs> for where we have come. What's your take on this um, in light of the confirmation hearing, notwithstanding the fact that Todd and French agree on the value of the free press in society? And also, um, how students at the university level should be consuming news um, in this era of quote unquote fake news? And that's a very big question, so I'll just uh, say one or two things. I mean, I do, social media is a big phenomenon, or let's just put it more broadly the combination of the internet and the mobile device and the instantaneity of information and of transforming or uh, transmitting. Uh, information and opinions and the ability for those to be sometimes based on fake news or to be fake news. And that is a big change. I, I, I guess I'm generally a skeptic when it comes to people saying, you know, everything's changed, technology's moving faster than it ever did. I grew up in the 60s and then in school in the 70s when that was just a total cliche. You know, everyone, everything's moving so much faster than it did. Our parents were so out of it. They lived such complacent lives, you know. And we are the ones who are really in this maelstrom of modernity and technology. It was total nonsense. Total nonsense. <laughs> my parents and my grandparents went through infinitely more yeah, social no, no, change <laughs> than I did. They fought, they met much greater challenges, obviously, with the Depression and the war here in the U.S., to say nothing of people who were in Europe and elsewhere at the time. And they were the technological changes in transportation, communication, and all that. Actually, I would say weirdly, from about 19, I don't know, 65 to 95, you could argue there was relatively little change in people's actual everyday lives and things kind of chugged along. I do think, though, that the the, the change of the uh, in communications now is awfully big. And it's going to, look, you can't stop it, and you don't want to stop it. And it has, like all technological changes, good and bad effects. And I'm not sure we've caught up to thinking through how to try to maximize the good effects and minimize the bad effects. I remain fairly libertarian in the sense that I'm not really comfortable with some of the efforts to shut down things or really have private a actors or public actors limit things in some radical ways, but I'm also open to, you know, there is a big problem that stuff, and I've seen it myself and you're certainly seen it, you know, people just believe, uh, believing things, well-educated people, people on weekly standard cruises, which, you know, upper middle class readers of the weekly standard who want to spend a week seeing some nice part of the country or the world and also have some panel discussions with Fred Barnes and me and everyone. You know, I mean, telling me things that are just That's false. That's a really unique subset me, of people. No, but, but this, is why, this is why it freaks me out a little, because these are not actually the, you know, disillusioned white working class voters in the, who never talk, you know, don't know anything and aren't in touch with whatever and who are therefore fall for this kind of propaganda. I mean, these are well-educated people who are, pillars of their community in many cases. I mean, phys you know, physicians, lawyers, businessmen, and women who then uh, tell you something and you say, well, that, that's just not true. I mean, you know, it's, there's not much controversy about the fact there weren't three million 
illegal voters in the, in the 2016. No, I saw it on TV, and, I, <laughs> and, my, and a friend of mine sent me an article about it. And, you know, and, the, and there, the, the ability to you know, cut and paste fake news articles, the Facebook problem, and so forth, it is a real problem. And I, I don't know what to do about it, but I think we, do, we can't minimize it. Yeah, I mean, I think the great irony here is the fake news is is really not promoted by the people. I mean, the, the right. rise of fake news is, it, it definitely happens a little bit on the left, but there's a lot of kind of insane fake things happening. I mean, I'll just say, I can all laugh and joke about it, but, you know, I, uh, I, was, I was a little bit in the WikiLeaks stuff, so I was monitoring very closely what happened every day. The Friday before the election, Right, the Friday before the election, Drudge has on uh, like a gigantic banner, basically alluding to a sex ring in a in Comet Pizza, which is literally five no seven blocks from my house. And the whole idea of this was because there was an email talking about ordering a pizza. They built in there was this narrative moving that there was a. Um, you know, pedophile pizza ring that was connected to Hillary Clinton, which was insane. And in all these conversations with, we've had multiple conversations with Facebook over the last year and a half, and I asked them how many, how many people saw that story via Facebook, and it's millions of people see a crazy lunatic story like that. So what I would find instructive is if Donald Trump would attack actual fake news, right? But that's not, he's not attacking... Yeah like that kind of lunacy. He's attacking NBC News, the Wall, not the Wall Street Journal as much, but sometimes, but like <laughs> the New York Times and the mainstream pillars of institutions that are designed to actually give us a common set of facts. Do I agree with all these things all the time? Is, uh, is there too much opinion in news? You know, I would even say myself, there's way too much news analysis and not enough news gathering. But the idea that we have politicians who just literally argue the press is a constituency group that they are attacking or don't, that they don't feel as part of their, what they need to deal with is a gigantic red flag for America. And, you know, I think it's some, another reason why we are living in deeply perilous times. And, you know, we can't, it's like the idea that we just find it acceptable that we have a president who just, literally goes to rallies and people start screaming about how CNN should be in jail or banned. You know, if that happened in another country, we'd be like, hello, where's the, where, why, are, why are we funding them via State Department dollars, right? But it happens here and we're, we, we accept it. I mean, I just, I very much agree with that. I would add one thing. I do think it's a matter of actual public policy. I think the right answer on most of the actual media organizations is a kind of you know, free market, free press kind of answer. Uh, maybe we can think about, you know, changing the economic playing field a little bit to make it easier for people to, uh, for newspapers to survive and for magazines and all that. As the editor of a magazine, I'd be happy if that were the case, but that gets complicated too. I think the Facebook situation, the social media situation is actually a very important government, I mean, genuine public policy issue, which I don't, and there's been interesting debates and there's begun to be some interesting debates about it, I guess I would say. Facebook, Google to a slightly lesser degree, but still very important. I, this is Amazon, I think it's a different kind of question. And it is just unnatural that so much happens on one particular platform, which both wants to say it's a platform, but isn't just a platform, yeah. obviously, mm -hmm. and but wants to legally be treated as a platform when it's to its advantage, so that we're not liable for anything, we're just a platform, you know? But actually, we're also feeding you stuff that you've shown an interest deciding, in. they're deciding, right? They're deciding. What yeah, they're so I mean, that's a very unusual situation. I think it's not comparable to NBC, CBS, ABC, PBS, uh, CNN being on Comcast. I mean, then you can watch whatever you want to watch. There could still be problems with fake news, ditto with going online to read you know, column was probably from the Weekly Standard or from the Nation, but in, leaving aside the Google algorithm issue, which I think is lesser, you know, there's, you can find what you want, you can read what you want. Facebook's a little unique in, in its pervasiveness, and if we came down from Mars and looked at it, I think, I think we would think this is sort of weird in a liberal mm -hmm. democracy that believes in dispersion of power and authority and diversity of sources of opinion. And I think it's, it's, I don't know what to do about it. You don't want to serve, somebody wants to serve utility, antitrust, there are a million different interesting issues.
but I think it's actually a pretty important public policy yeah, issue. Yeah, and I mean, like, we have problems here, but in other countries, I mean, people have right. been basically just murdered by mobs of people who are just literally motivated by a Facebook, you know, crazy Facebook postings, right? So it's, it's you know, something to be concerned about. So just in the interest of time, this will be the second to last question. <laughs> <laughs> Given the fact well, that we can, speed up. We can fill oh, a yeah. bunch of yeah. it. It's the, the last question. You know? so, no, no, the last one's a good one. So okay. Nice. <laughs> Given, the fact, Given the fact that so many people are non-voters and are disillusioned with the <laughs> system, do you think that in addition to promoting bipartisanship, we should, as a nation, invite more independent and third-party voices into mainstream discourse? Do you want me to start? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think the challenge of this structurally is we live in a, we, we, if we had a parliamentary system, I, you know, basically say, just to be fast about this, I'd basically be fine, right? But I think the challenge we have is that in the system we have now, uh, it is a little bit winner take all. And when people, I mean, we have now gone through two elections where the vote total in states Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, votes for Jill Stein were larger than the difference that Hillary lost by. And obviously everyone remembers Florida and the number of people who voted for Ralph Nader in Florida. And you can say that those people are like voting outside the system or they didn't like Hillary, whatever you want to say. But in the system that we have right now, my deep fear is that people are essentially voting the opposite, not just different, the opposite of their interests when that happens. If we could figure out a system in which we <coughs> all move to have vibrant third parties, that would be, you know, that would be basically fine to me and parties should be tested. And, um, uh, but I think the challenge we have is that we are now living with two examples of the consequences of uh, that decision. I mean, I am open to the notion that the two-party system, which I think most people would say has served us well for many decades, even more than a such, almost two centuries, is problematic, has become more problematic. And I'm open to the notion that in 2020, if, if it's Trump and, a, and Bernie Sanders, we should, I would probably try to support an independent candidate who might be able to even win. So I'm open sort of analytically to the notion that the two-party system could get rocky here, the, the rickety in the next few years. Having said that, as a practical matter, I would advise people to fight within the parties for now, just for the reason Nira says, and because that's still where 98% of our elected officials are coming from. Uh, I think, the, and there are reasons why more extreme people uh, do better in primaries for obvious reasons, they're more motivated, they can be gotten out to vote more, but that needn't be the case. In fact, I mean, there are instances where the opposite has happened, and I would say to the Democrats' credit, a lot of their nominees in 2018 in my district in Northern Virginia where I live were not the most radical candidate, often a more mainstream mm -hmm. candidate. Uh, and so that, a lot of that was due to the mobilization of women who actually want women representatives, but they don't necessarily want left-wing representatives. So a lot of the women who are running, at least in Virginia, which I know a little bit about, are pretty moderate, I would say, women. So I would sort of recommend to people, that everyone's entitled to do what they want, and if they want to sort of explore third parties and independent candidacies, either at the state level or the national level. But I think in the short term, one reason I'm focused on fighting for Trump within the Republican Party is it may fail, and I may be out in some, you know, going back to the Democratic Party of my scoop jacks and youth, or, <laughs> or, 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 or going to help start some new Whig party like some of my friends want to do. Um, I think it's a catchy, catchy term, right? That Whigs, yeah. Whigs. It's really going well in Iowa and New Hampshire, you know? It's so but, out, it's in. But you don't want to write off, you don't want to write off one of the two major national parties. I mean, American politics has benefited a lot, whatever you think of the problems and et cetera from having two national parties that were not European style, authoritarian right-wing parties or authoritarian left-wing parties. It's yeah. kind of what American exceptionalism, what the actual social science term means, actually, in a, uh, used by sociologists and political scientists. And so you really don't want to, if, as a conservative, as a Republican, you don't want to write off the Republican Party to become that kind of party. It may happen, and that would be bad, I think, for the country, but you, know, you don't want to just let one bad election sort of shape it for the future. So I would generally, I'm, I'm sort of more in the market of, in the business of encouraging people to fight within both parties, at least for the time being. And just briefly on this, it, you know, the difference between the U.S. and, and European parties, which are multi-party systems, is the, both the Democratic and Republican Party are basically coalition parties. I mean, 
the structure is not actually radically different than, in, in fact, if you look at France and their elections, it's basically like two parties in one in, in the Democratic Party and two parties in one in the Republican Party. So it's not like views aren't represented. I, of course, the primaries are the places to do that. But I think, I think there's a health, actually, to being able to formulate a broad coalition yeah. to govern a country as diverse as ours. Great. Then I'm going to go ahead and ask the last question. At the beginning, much anticipated and hyped last question. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, 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 at the beginning of the conversation, you both established a shared respect for values and democratic principles. What advice do you have for having these kinds of conversations with those who don't seem to agree? Uh, I'll let her stay think away of, I'll from cable news. Yeah. Oh. I'll answer it in this way, but I'll let, I'll let Nira really answer it, and I'll just give you a comment. I, mean, I was just at a debate a panel in Austin, actually, uh, two days ago, and this kind of question came up. And someone on the panel, this was mostly conservatives on the panel, was that this is it. Trump, this, the, what we see now, it's going to get worse and worse. I mean, this is, this is the future. Trump's America, Trump's kind of politics. And I really don't believe it, or I don't want to believe it, I suppose. And I mean, we were just kind of going back and forth on it. And I said, well, let's step away from, you may be right about Congress, I think this, I said to him. Uh, or about political elites and maybe even the states, which I think have been healthier in some ways, are going more in this direction. Certainly Texas uh, would be a case study of that with more partisanship. But I, I don't know. I just look at my kids who are, you know, in their early 30s and, and their spouses. And I don't know. It doesn't feel to me like they're living in a bitterly divided country where they don't know anyone who differs with them politically. It's just not the case. Or people of very, very different backgrounds. So I do think I'm sort of more hopeful about younger Americans. Now, my kids are not in, you know, perfectly representative socioeconomically, obviously. So, <laughs> so maybe I'm capturing just a little slice, but I get around some. And I, it doesn't feel to me like the country is as divided or as bitter or as uh, uh, worrisome in its condition as, the, as our political class and certainly as Washington. I mean, I think that's, so I, I think the more the country can assert a certain kind of common sense, uh, sense of community and of uh, willingness to talk to one another. Uh, we can overcome some of the hyperpartisanship and hyperpolarization, which I think is somewhat due, and you're right, it wasn't just due to Trump, is somewhat due to sort of somewhat, I don't know, artificial rules of the game almost in Washington that have led in this direction mm -hmm. more than they need to have. Now, if I'm wrong, and the country itself is deeply riven and deeply divided and, and you know, uh, and there are some, some, there's some sociological evidence that, you know, people live more in groups that yeah, they agree with and more apart and all that kind of sorting and all that kind of stuff. But there's some truth to that maybe. So maybe I'm wrong, in which case we're in worse trouble than we, than we think. But I would not say just traveling around America that I feel like this is a country that is nearly as bitter or divided as you would think by looking at, at Washington. So I think, you know, I guess my view of this, and I guess I could be totally wrong as well, but I think essentially people, people there, there are large swaths of people who feel like they aren't heard and feel like the political <coughs> system, and, and like you know, institutions aren't responsive to them. And you know, we'll see a test of this, but like, you know, I, I, um, Connor Lamb has ran for, uh, as a member of Congress for Pennsylvania 18, and I should just advertise that he was a CAP intern at one point. Um, and I talked to him a lot about his race, and I mean, I think this is like a genuine question about how politics will go into the future. He basically uh, knocked on 200,000 doors. You know, he spent all this time just knocking on people's doors. He saw a lot of Republicans, very Republican district, and he genuinely believes he went to those people and like listened to them and a, and a pretty good swath of people who haven't voted for a Democrat in a very long time voted for him. And Beto O'Rourke is running this campaign, which has been very much designed over the last year and a half. He's going to the reddest parts of the state. He's going to every part of the state, but a big part of what he does is he goes to red parts of the state and says, you know, he listens to people, he runs <coughs> town halls, he hears from people, he has his own views, but he's like very consciously trying to listen. And I personally think that the Democratic nominee in 2020 will have to have that kind of talent, the ability to go to people who don't think like you do, listen to them, and not just agree with them, convince them that you 
may disagree substantively, but like we're in this country together. And I think there are a whole range of candidates right now, and we'll see what happens uh, 37 days. But there are people who are not, you know, the candidates who are running in purple and red districts, who are Democrats, who are coming from outside the political system, are not running as bitter partisans. You know, they are running as people who are outside the political process, who are willing to hear from anyone and try to actually address problems. And I actually think when they go to Washington, they will really fight to actually push these bills. So, you know, I think at the end of the day, like a lot of people feel like politics isn't producing results to them. And we as institutions have to answer to that. Like we have to actually deliver results for people. And they haven't seen a lot of change and they haven't seen improvement in their life. And, you know, the, ne the next president actually has to produce for them or I think it could get worse. So I do, I do think that this act of listening and hearing people is a vital act of politics. And mm -hmm. One that I think good leaders get, and really good leaders get that. Bill Clinton, you know, won white working class voters a long time ago, but won them. And a lot of that was like he was going to parts of the country that hadn't seen a Democrat in a long time, and he listened to them. Um, I think that's a, a great note to um, end on. Please um, join me in thanking the panel. We have a, a special treat now, and I just want to invite um, President Mark Schlissel up to the podium for some re additional remarks. Thank you so much. So, hi, everybody. Thanks, uh, Dean Barr, for the introduction. I, I want to give a thanks to uh, Dean Angela Dillard, too, for giving me meaning in life. And now that I know my job is to teach what can't be Googled. So I, I really love that. I also want to give a shout out to Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, our, our local congresswoman who slipped in the back in, in her humble fashion a little bit late, but thank you for coming, Debbie, as well. And of course, all the U of M students and faculty and staff that are here today, along with our special guests, Bill Crystal and Neera Tendon, who just seem much more peaceful here in person than on television, so it's really great. <laughs> uh, but really for your dedication to having these kind of conversations across difference. Uh, it's especially heartening that uh, students are here from all three of our campuses, which speaks to the terrific efforts of everyone at We Listen to be broad and inclusive in recruiting students to their group. Um, this, what, this conversation wasn't what I expected. I expected it to be perhaps a little bit more incendiary, perhaps there to be more disagreement. Maybe I was projecting my sense of the public sensibility right now, but these are really preeminent spokespersons on different parts of the political spectrum and listen to what we heard. You know, we heard areas where there were agreement and we heard areas where there was respectful disagreement. We didn't hear people talking over one another. Uh, we didn't have a, a commentator inserting the, their own preferences and prejudices and he allowed the experts to speak. Um, way more agreement than I thought there would be and way better than television. So thank you very much. As a university president, I've learned to take, compliment, take compliments where you can get them, is what you got to do. But all around our nation, college campuses are struggling with something that really should be second nature, and that's the freedom and comfort to discuss contentious and uh, challenging topics. You know, perhaps it's a symptom of the times, an era of great political polarization, as we heard, and one in which the media offers us the ability to tune into news and commentary of a defined political slant. Maybe it's because of a mixture of politeness and fear, not wanting to offend fellow students with ideas that go against their perceived mainstream on campus, or fearing the social consequences of doing so. I first learned of We Listen, a student group last year during one of some of my fireside chats that I have each month with students. Uh, Ali, of course, who's here today, and another student came to my office hours later that semester and shared the progress that they've made with their new organization. They brought together students of differing political philosophies, not just from U of M, but now around the state and uh, here around the region and hopefully around the country. Uh, they sponsored difficult conversations here on gun control, abortion, free speech, and immigration. Uh, they're taking their message to the nation's capital and demonstrating that college students most certainly can engage in honest and thoughtful discussion of some of society's toughest problems. And in fact, they are willing to step up and propose solutions through these policy creation seminars. I also thank Dean Barr and his colleagues here at the Ford School for taking uh, action to respond to one of our university's greatest challenges, 
how to promote discourse across difference in an era of extreme political polarization. The Conversations Across Difference initiative is grounded in the highest ideals of the mission of the University of Michigan. It enhances our academic excellence by bringing speakers to campus and implementing curricular elements that teach the value, meaning, and importance of citizenship in our society. And one of the requirements of good citizenship is we consider issues of the day from diverse perspectives. I've always believed that hearing ideas we disagree with challenges our own ways of thinking. It helps us sharpen our own beliefs and it helps us grow. Engaging across difference teaches us how to work through problems in groups and how to express ourselves in ways that can bring about positive change. But first, we must listen. There's no shortage of opportunity to address major challenges in our modern world, to demonstrate that we can disagree without demonizing and debate without demagoguery, to solve problems using the breadth of our collective human talents drawing from the experiences and the intellectual power of people of all backgrounds and ideologies. I'm hopeful that your work here will also make a difference by encouraging greater turnout in this November's election. Michigan students will have the opportunity to act on the knowledge and perspectives you and our speakers have shared today and over the past several months. In the last midterm election, only 19% of eligible college students voted, and that number was even lower on our own campus. I know that the Ford School, our College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and many of the students here today have worked with our Ginsburg Center to help U of M win the Big Ten Voter Challenge. The challenge is a nonpartisan initiative to encourage students to exercise the right to vote and to change the trend that's led to voter turnout for people under age 30 being historically low compared with older segments of the population. Already, hundreds of Michigan students have gotten registered this cycle. October 9th is the last day to register for the November elections here in Michigan. I was reminded again of the importance of your work on my way into the auditorium. Right outside here is a portrait of the namesake of our School of Public Policy, Gerald Ford. During his final State of the Union in 1977, Ford spoke of a country that two and a half years earlier was deeply divided and tormented. That was the state of our union when I was a college student. He expressed hope and confidence in the future of the then 200-year-old nation and reminded us that the future of our union, in fact, relied on us embracing unity. The state of the union is a measurement of the many elements of which it's composed, he said. It's a political union of diverse states, an economic union of varying interests, an intellectual union of common convictions, and a moral union of immutable ideals. I want to thank all of you for accepting the challenge to engage across difference. By joining together to listen and to learn, you also inspire. And you demonstrate that no divide is insurmountable when we share the important aspiration of a more perfect union. Thank you all very, very much. I invite you all to join us for a reception outside. Thank you.